So we've been going through a series, Back to the Basics. This is week five. And we spent the first four weeks taking a deep dive into who we actually are in Christ and how we're called to operate in, in his kingdom. That Jesus himself said that it requires a childlike humility to even enter the kingdom. We have to humble ourselves because when we're operating in, in pride, it draws us to build our own kingdom. When we operate in humility, we lay our will, we lay our domain, we lay our, our resources, we give our whole life to actually submit to his kingdom. And it takes childlike humility, childlike faith to be able to do that. And then we looked at what is the kingdom? If it requires childlike humility to enter the kingdom, what is it we're entering through childlike humility? Here's the thing, you could conquer a nation just because the white flag is raised and the enemy's been conquered doesn't mean that all of a sudden that nation embodies the culture and the laws and the principles of, of the conquering nation. So Jesus was victorious on the cross, but there's still a process of actually going in and inhabiting and, and creating the culture of the kingdom again here on earth. Those keys were given away. Now they've been brought back. Jesus told Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. But there's a process of his kids as his ambassadors going and actually making the culture of earth match that which is in heaven, which is victorious over all the powers of darkness. If you've ever read Chris Valentin's book, Heavy Rain, he talks about the history in Greek and Roman culture of apostles that that when the Roman Empire would conquer a new territory, they would actually send these leaders into that territory to shape the culture to match Rome. And so these apostolic leaders in the Roman Empire would go with, with a band of people, architects and musicians and cooks and, and merchants, to actually shape that territory or that city to look like Rome, to have the culture of Rome. And it was the goal of those leaders that when Caesar came to that city, he would walk down the center street, he'd see Roman architecture, he'd, he'd hear Roman music, and he would say, this is Rome. And that's what we get to do as sons and daughters in his kingdom, is we're actually ushering in the culture of the kingdom here on earth. His kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He desires to work through us, that we're actually shaping the earth with reestablished domain of the keys of the kingdom in our hands, we're shaping the earth into the likeness of the kingdom of God. So one day when Jesus returns, he'll see that his kingdom has been established here on earth. That we weren't just waiting for a ticket out. We're here to yield ourselves to his kingdom, to establish his kingdom here on earth, not our own will. We talked about the destiny of sonship. As sons and daughters, each one of us have things that he's prepared beforehand for us. A calling, a purpose, a destiny that he desires to fulfill through us. You may have heard the quote, Without him, we can't. Without us, he won't. Without him, we can't establish his kingdom here on earth. But without us, he won't. Now granted, he can... He does work supernaturally and sovereignly. There are times that God just moves apart from any man. But the heart of that, that concept is he desires to partner with us. He could do it all himself, yet he desires to partner with his kids. And we get to walk in that purpose and that destiny and the fullness of his spirit inside of us as sons and daughters in his kingdom. And then last week we talked about the bride of Christ. That we get to walk corporately as the bride of Christ. And we get to recognize that he pursued us even when we had run away. Even when we had sold ourselves out to sin. He chased us down with unrelenting love. We talked about the difference between covenant and contract. Sometimes we're holding God to a contract where we just really want what we want from him. We're not actually stepping into covenant saying... You have all of me. Two very different things. 
We get to walk as the bride of Christ. We're preparing ourselves for him like we read in Revelation. And Jesus loves his bride. He cherishes his bride. That his bride would be washed in the water of his word like we read in Ephesians last week. So today we're going to talk about sowing and reaping. Reaping what you've sown. It's a principle in the kingdom. The kingdom is based on lots of different principles. And you could go a lot of different directions in regard to sowing and reaping. But we read in Galatians, there's the opportunity to sow into the flesh in which you'll reap in the flesh or sow into the spirit in which you'll reap eternal life in the spirit. That this concept, this principle of sowing and reaping works for both good or evil. And as sons and daughters in his kingdom, we get to sow in through the spirit and therefore reap a harvest in the spirit. And this is reflected in a variety of ways in scripture, but today we're going to talk about sowing the word of God in our hearts, that it would sprout up and it would produce a harvest in and through us. Sometimes we would like to think that we can just reap the benefits of Scripture without sowing anything or tending anything. Again, it's that contract mentality that, God, because your word says this, if I just quote it and then demand something from you, then all of a sudden there'll be this harvest. The kingdom is built on sowing and reaping. And there's a way to do that properly in the kingdom, and there's a way to do that improperly in the kingdom. And so we're going to talk about that today. I'm currently part of a discipleship program with Global Awakening with Randy Clark School that's going on. And one of our lessons this week was, was from Andrew Womack. And he had a, a profound quote where he says, Asking God to give peace without planting the word of God in our hearts is just as foolish as a farmer praying for crops without being willing to plant seeds. That makes you think a little bit. That, that holds a punch. When we think about sowing and reaping, sometimes we just want the microwave faith, the quick benefit. And God's saying, you have my spirit, you have my word, sow it and see the harvest that's produced through, through, through rich, fertile soil. But I think microwave faith mentality is actually contrary to covenant relationship. Microwave faith is aligned with contractual relationship, not covenant relationship. A lot, of team, a lot of times the most powerful things in life are the ones that take time and intentionality and investment. And God is saying, hey, I've given you everything. Come, abide with me, sow and reap in my kingdom and see the harvest that I want to produce through your heart, through your life. But if we think about this concept of sowing and reaping, Sowing and reaping doesn't just happen through general vicinity. Just because you have a bag of seeds and you're in front of an open field doesn't mean that anything's been planted. Just because a husband and wife are in the same vicinity doesn't mean there's a child being birthed or conceived. And yet sometimes we think maybe if I'm just in the general vicinity of God, if I'm in the general vicinity of the church, something will be birthed out of me. It's not about just general vicinity. It's covenant. It's intimacy where, where God's word and his spirit are actually inside of us. That his word is being deposited inside of us like a seed and tended. And there's time that actually births something new in us in the spiritual realm. But it does take time. Again, you could have that bag of seed. You have the field. You go through the intentionality, and you actually put the seed in the ground. Sometimes we're like, God, I put the seed in the ground. Where's the harvest? He's like, that's good. You did the first step. Now we get to water it. Now we get to tend it. Now we get to tend that harvest over that crop over time, and there will be a harvest. 
But sometimes we just demand from our contract, we demand what we want from the Lord. We say, we put the seed in the ground. And then we're not actually patient. And we leave the seed and it all just dies because we're not even there for the process that it takes to produce a harvest. So we're going to look at the parable of the sower as we're learning about sowing and reaping and how we can actually do this well in the context of a walk with Jesus. We're going to start with this parable from Matthew 13. We're going to start in verse 18. The parable was, we're going to read from the explanation of the parable in a moment, but the the parable itself was the parable of the sower. That a sower went out to sow seed. And the seed is the word of God or the word of the kingdom. And some falls along the path and is sitting there on the hard ground and it gets plucked off the ground by the birds. Some goes into the rocky soil and there's no root. Some goes into the thorns and it gets choked out. And then some goes into the fertile soil and it produces a harvest, 30 and 60 and 100 fold. And then Jesus is explaining this parable to the disciples. And in the context of Mark, he, he makes this comment that unless, if you don't understand this parable, how are you going to understand all the rest? So there's a significance to this parable where he's saying there's something in here that will actually give you a key to unlock all the other parables that Jesus is going to be teaching. So it's a very important parable. He goes on and he's explaining the disciples have come and they, they don't quite understand what he was meaning by the parable of the sower. And so they're, they're getting clarification. What does it actually mean? He says in verse 18, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. And for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown in good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, in another thirty. So we've got... The seed of God's word being planted, we've got the heart of man receiving it, and there's different postures of the heart that are attributed to different types of soil and are different circumstances in which the, wit, the, the seed is sown. On the path, it's hard ground, and it's stolen. It says the enemy steals it basically based off of not understanding what's being taught. Many of you know I, I don't come from the traditional uh, background that's expected for a pastor. I don't come from the educational background. And there's, some, there's a lot of things that I'm learning along the way over the last two years. And it's been an amazing grace walk with the Lord. There's a lot of things I'm really glad I didn't learn in the educational system. And one of these is that sometimes we get so intellectual and theolo- theological that we're not actually preaching anything that's practical or understandable. And seed can get stolen if we're not actually getting people to a place of understanding. So I say it all the time. We don't fully, it's a quote actually from Einstein, but I'll take credit for it. We don't actually fully understand something until we can explain it simply. Because if we're called to enter the kingdom with childlike humility... If we're called to walk like children, it's got to be simple. If it's incredibly complex and it's not bearing fruit, there's probably an element of it's gotten so heady that it's not practical to our lives anymore. So in one sense, teaching in a way that people will understand is incredibly important. In another sense, discipling people to actually receive revelation through God's word is incredibly important. Because just because we read the Bible like a history book doesn't mean it's being planted in our heart or there's true revelation and understanding. 
So we teach it in a way that can be understood, and we teach people to read Scripture themselves and receive revelation through the Spirit. Otherwise, the enemy is always looking for hard ground for misunderstanding that can be plucked. Plucking that seed right off of people's hearts. Then there's the rocky ground. It's received with joy, but it says there's no root in himself. Think of like a child. A child's born. A seed has been sown and something's been birthed. The child's born, but he doesn't have the roots to just go pick up his own life and, and go from there. Again, there's a process of discipleship. If, if this seed has been sown and it's in rocky ground where there's no roots, we need to go actually invest in and disciple people to remove the rocks and actually establish the deep roots. It might have been received with joy, but there's not actually the depth yet in order to be sustained on its own. And so in this rocky ground, it sprouts up, there's joy, but then all of a sudden the, the trials and the tribulations of the earth come and scorch it because there's no root. We see this a lot where someone's received the gospel, they start coming to church, and, and that's the end of the discipleship road. Is just come to church next Sunday. Church is a good thing. Gathering corporately is a good thing, but it's not discipleship in its entirety. And so are we taking the time to disciple people when they don't have root for themselves yet, but there's a willingness to receive the word of God with joy? Are we willing to actually walk with people and disciple them to deep, fertile soil where they can actually produce a harvest? It says that they endure for a while, but then they fall away because of tribulation and persecution. Now, the thorns is interesting because the thorns, get cho the, the thorns choke out the harvest because of cares of the world and deceitfulness of riches. In the Mark 4 account of this parable, he also adds the desires for other things. Cares of the world, de deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things. How many know just because you give your life to Jesus doesn't mean there aren't other options and desires? You can be established, in the case of the thorns, you can actually have roots and still be choked out and made unfruitful because you're given to just so many other desires. Jesus isn't actually preeminent of all those. And notice, in the rocky soil, it says that it fell away. It died. In the thorns, it didn't say that it died. It just said it was unfruitful. I think it was Pastor Tina saying this week that she was doing some research on the Cherry Blossom Festival. Tell me if I get this right. Cherry Blossom Festival, where it's these beautiful cherry blossoms. Everybody comes out to see the cherry blossoms. And yet the nature is they're actually, they bear no fruit. They're beautiful on the outside, but they bear no fruit. They're not actually functioning in what they're meant to function in, but they look amazing on the outside. Sometimes that's the seed that falls among the thorns, is it looks like things are growing. It looks like there's depth that's growing up, but there's all these cares of the world that just pull it in different directions. The plant doesn't die. It just bears unfruitful, which means you're probably, you probably still look like you're following Jesus, but there's no fruit being produced. You're not actually producing what you are intended to, what you're made for. We were made to produce fruit. It's in our nature. We're made to worship the Lord. We're made to overflow with his spirit. We're made to partner with him. But it proves un unfruitful. Then in the good soil, it says that he hears the word, he accepts it, and bears fruit. When we're planting the word of God in our hearts, it's not always pleasant to accept. Sometimes it cuts a little bit because there's a process of pressing in to scripture with the revelation of the Holy Spirit that's actually cutting away our flesh. And it's not a pleasant process sometimes. So it's not just whether you hear the word. It's not just whether you can quote it or say that you heard that sermon or read that book, but there's a hearing of the word and then there's an accepting of the word. Allowing the, the flesh to be cut away. 
allowing it to shape us, allowing it to mold us. And through hearing it and accepting it, being attached to the true vine, we bear fruit. 30, 60, or 100 fold. So we have to check in on our own hearts. How is the soil of our hearts? And the thing is, is different parts of our lives might have different types of soil in different seasons. It's not like, oh, yep, I said the prayer, so my heart's good soil. Realistically, it might be in this area, my heart is deep, fertile soil. In this area, I'm really conflicted because there's an area of my life that I haven't surrendered fully to him yet. When I began really walking in relationship with Jesus, there were these compartments. I was like, oh, man. It was the, first, it was the recognition that Jesus actually wanted a relationship with me. He didn't just want lip service. But when I realized he actually wanted a relationship with me, there were like certain compartments that I was like, yeah, absolutely, have at it. And I didn't even realize I was holding other things back. And then over time, the Holy Spirit's so faithful to say, hey, how about this part of your life? How about this compartment that you haven't given me free reign in? And one by one, he looks to cultivate the soil of those areas that he can actually remove what's hindering me from growing into all that he's called me to, and then depositing his word, his truth, his voice in that area. But it doesn't mean that just because we've said a prayer, we go to church, that all of a sudden that means we're in the fourth category. And so we can go to the Lord and we can actually seek him on, Lord, what are the parts of my heart that don't have deep and rich soil? And would you tend the soil of my heart to receive your word and actually produce the harvest that you desire? Now, there's also the aspect of what are we planting in our hearts? Because again, sowing and reaping goes both ways. Sometimes we're doing the things we think we're supposed to in the Lord, but we're planting something very different in our hearts that's producing a harvest. We're tending different things. Sometimes we might even be asking God to remove something, or let's say it's, there's an anxiousness over a particular area of life, and we're asking God to give us peace. Yet if we were really to listen, we'd recognize we're actually sowing the anxiousness of our own heart that we're asking him to give us peace for. And he's saying, dig up the things you've been sowing and sow my word and you'll have peace. We doing all right? Okay. We're going deep today. But sometimes we're asking him to fix the problem that we've actually been tending in our own hearts. So we're sowing things through music, through the news, through all these other things, and we're like, I don't have time to read God's word. Well, great, you're reaping the harvest of what you've sown in your heart. Because we all have time for a lot of things. We all have 24 hours in a day. That time is going somewhere. And if we're uncomfortable with what's being produced and harvested in our heart, we have to go back to say, what are we actually sowing into our heart? What are we actually tending in our heart? Because we've got the answer. We've got our heavenly father's words of life in front of us. And he's saying, please take it with the spirit that's inside you. Go and deposit that word in your heart and see the harvest that I want to produce in you. But if all you're sowing and all you're tending is things of the world, you're going to produce a harvest of the world. And it's going to lead to fear, anxiety, discontentment, bitterness, unforgiveness. That's what's been harvested. That's what's being harvested. And so we go to the Lord and we say, God, would you help me in this area or that area or give me peace or help me? And he's saying, I absolutely want to help you. But my kingdom is built on sowing and harvesting, so partner with me. And sow into your heart the things of my kingdom. And you'll recognize that the things you're praying to go away will naturally go away because they've been choked out. They've been dug up. The roots are taken out. And something life-giving has actually been planted there. We can, plant new, we can pull up bad roots. We can plant new seeds and produce a new harvest in partnership with the Lord.
Because again, what happens sometimes is we're trying to attain contractual benefits of Scripture without actually being in covenant relationship with Jesus. Remember, contracts are not about fully giving yourself. It's about trying to retain as much of yourself as possible and protect, protect your backside. You're trying to get something. You're trying to make sure that something is given in your benefit so that you don't get um, duped, essentially. But we're trying to attain the benefits of being a new creation while holding on to our old creation. This is in Mark 2 where he's talking about old and new wineskins. He said, new wine goes in new wineskins. New wine doesn't go in old wineskins. Otherwise, you put the new wine in the old wineskins, the wineskin's going to burst and the wine's going to pour out. The purpose is he's saying old and new don't go together. The goal of walking with Jesus is not to take Jesus and add him to our old life to make it a little better. He's saying new and old don't go together. They don't mix. It's not to have a little bit of new creation mixed in with the old creation that we gratified ourselves with in the past. It's that we would actually fully walk in the new creation that we've been made into. When we're made into a new creation, when our spirit's been made brand new in Jesus, it's actually unnatural for us to sin. It's actually unnatural for us to operate in the flesh. Doesn't mean we're perfect because we all fall short. We're all still growing and being sanctified. But our nature has been made brand new in Jesus with his spirit being made one with ours. And therefore, when we, we, when we go back and gratify the flesh, it's actually strange. It's actually unnatural to the spirit that's been made new inside of us. Think of renewing our minds. We're not just trying to fill our minds with all the things of the world and then asking God when we need it to give us new thoughts. We're actually laying down what we used to dwell on in our old self, and we're picking up the mind of Christ. That we're actually transformed by the renewing of our minds, a brand new mind. That we've actually yielded our whole mind to him. Not just that we're asking for new thoughts when our old thoughts are dictating us, or when we're sowing into our old mindsets. We're actually digging up those roots and pulling them out so that the mind of Christ can be deposited in us. Same with our will. We're not here to take our own will and then try and use Jesus to accomplish our will. We're giving up our will. We're giving up the old so that the new actually comes and becomes our desire. That our heart is actually shaped and molded by the spirit that we don't even desire the things that we used to desire. But our hearts have been made one with Christ and therefore our desires and our will actually align with his. That we desire that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not that we're using him to try and accomplish our will. I heard a phrase last week or the week before. It was spirit-led, soul-fed. So like in Romans 8, it talks about by the spirit, we put to death the deeds of the body and we actually live. We live by the spirit. We don't live by the flesh or the soul. We're spirit-led, but our soul is fed. Our soul will go in whatever direction you feed it. If you feed it the world, it's going to produce the world. If you feed it the spirit, it's going to produce the spirit. Your soul being your mind, will, and emotions. We're spirit-led. The spirit is in the driver's seat. Jesus is preeminent in our lives, but we bring into alignment our soul, our mind, will, and emotions, and our, and our body. But it's based on what you feed it. The soul will tilt whichever way it's fed. Let's go to Mark 4, verse 26 through 29. It's another parable that Jesus is telling, but it gives some additional insight into this process of sowing and reaping. So starting in verse 26, and he said, the kingdom is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. 
So he's giving this basic process. Jesus used parables and analogies because people can relate to them. So he's saying, you're scattering seed. It's going into the ground. It begins to produce a harvest. And he, he mentions man doesn't even know how. Like it's just a process. He goes to sleep at night. He comes. He's tending it. And he starts to see the sprouts. But then he goes on and he says, the earth produces by itself first the blade and so on and so forth. So again, the seed is the word of the kingdom, the word of God. The soil is our hearts. And here's another interesting concept from Andrew Womack. There's nothing above ground that was not first beneath the ground. Sometimes we want the things above ground and we're not willing to go underground first. We're not willing to plant something. We're not willing to tend something. So in that concept that there's nothing above ground that was not first beneath the ground, we actually see it throughout creation. If you go back to Genesis, Genesis 1.11, it says, And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind, and on the earth, and it was so. So let the earth sprout vegetation. He didn't just say, let there be a vegetation. It was through the earth. Through the word of his mouth, the earth sprung up and produced vegetation. Then we go to the animals. Animals eat plants, right? Yet in Genesis 1.24, it says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. So again, he speaks to the earth, and the earth produces the living creatures. Then he goes and he creates man. Where does he create man from? From the dust, Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. So all the raw materials for life he had made into the ground, into the earth. And yet it was from his, his word, it was from his breath that became the seed that activated the earth to spring forth what he was calling for. It's the seed. It's the catalyst. Like in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So all scripture is God-breathed. So there's this principle that there's the earth and there's the seed, the catalyst, God's word that produces life. It's how the plant sprung forth. It's how the living creature sprang forth. It's through the breath of life that was, made, that was breathed into Adam who had been formed from the dirt. In the same way, all the raw materials for a baby are in the body of a woman. But it requires a seed. We see this principle played out through a variety of different aspects of our normal everyday life. In the same way, we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Ephesians 1.3. It requires a seed. It requires a deposit of the word of God to bring into fruition what's been placed inside of us. His spirit has been placed inside of us. And he's saying, deposit my word into the spirit that's inside you. And see all those spiritual blessings spring up. Yet from a contractual standpoint, we read that verse and we say, God, I'm supposed to have every blessing. Where is it? He's saying, deposit my word and you'll see it spring forth. Deposit my word deep into the fertile soil of your heart. It's the way God operates. Through sowing and reaping. He's not looking for a contractual relationship. He's not looking for a microwave faith. He's saying, I've given you everything you need. Now partner with me and deposit my word in your spirit, in your heart, and allow me to produce a harvest. When God's words are planted in our hearts, 
through our spirit, things of the kingdom spring forth. His purposes, his desires, his plans for us spring forth. On the contrary, what happens if we take the enemy's voice and we plant it in our hearts? There's a different harvest. Something different is birthed. On the one side, sometimes we we desire to birth the miraculous and we haven't even deposited his word in our heart to conceive anything. We're desiring birth without conception. On the other side... The seed we're receiving into our heart is actually not of the Lord and is produce, it's birthing something of the powers of darkness, of the domain of darkness. Read Psalm 714. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. The principle goes both ways. What are we depositing? What are we planting? What are we tending? What's being harvested? You can tell a tree by its fruit. You can tell by the harvest what's being planted. And a lot of times we think it's just by random chance we're going through the things that we are or experiencing the things that we are, and sometimes it is. Sometimes there are things outside of our control. But I'd say there's a lot, of, a lot more things in the walk of a believer that we actually have all the necessary resources to produce a harvest, to see God's harvest produced in our lives. But if it's the enemy that we're giving ear to and his words are being birthed into our heart, something very different is going to be birthed. And we need to go through and have discernment and and fill ourselves with God's word, but then also expose the lies, the bad roots that are being planted in our heart so we can pull those out and actually allow the fresh, fertile soil to take root in the things of God. That's why we're so big on things like sozo, or deliverance, or how we love, things that actually get the junk out of the way. You think if you're wanting to, I'm not a farmer, but I'm going to pretend I was. If you're planting things, and your whole yard is a mess of weeds and all kinds of stuff, the first thing you got to do is you got to dig it all out. Dig it all out, churn the soil, get all those things out of the way so that what's being planted can actually take root and produce something. And we have to do the same spiritually if there are deep, roots that we've received or lies we've believed or things that the enemy has sown, tear them out. It's not a shame condemnation thing. We're a house of freedom. We're a house of healing to go after those bad roots because if you try and plant new things over them, you're just always going to keep running into the roots. And you can be free of the bad roots. You can be free of the old lies. You can be free of the, the things that the enemy has tried to plant or the things that you've allowed to be planted in your own heart. You can be rid of all those things so that you can actually have fresh soil to begin depositing the word of God in to allow him to do all that he desires. Go ahead and stand with me. So in the life of a believer, it's vitally important For us to be depositing and planting the word of God in our hearts. It's not just a checklist thing. Oh, this is what Christians do. That everybody says we're supposed to read our Bible. So I'm just going to skim through a few verses each day. The words of God are seeds that we're planting in our soul. Again, spirit-led, soul-fed. We're choosing to live by the spirit. We're choosing not to be driven by the flesh or driven by our soul. And through that, by choosing to live through the spirit and depositing his his words, our soul does come into alignment. I guarantee the things that today seem like they're holding you back or things that are wrong thinking patterns or whatever, all of them can be broken. The spirit is above and beyond all the things that the flesh could throw at you. It doesn't mean there won't be discipline involved. It doesn't mean that there won't be a battle. It doesn't mean there won't be a process of digging out old things. But we can absolutely be free and live through the spirit of God inside of us and his word deposited in our hearts. But I think especially in this day and age, I think this is the greatest time to be alive. I could be biased because I'm living right now. I think this is one of the greatest times to be alive in history. 
First of all, because God's placed me here and he's placed you here. This is the greatest time for you to be alive. Imagine the plans and purposes God has for you, regardless of what's going on in the world. He's got things he wants to produce through your life in partnership with you as sons and daughters in his kingdom, as he's preparing the bride for the wedding feast of the lamb. But he needs rich soil to produce the harvest that he desires. As we go back to worship in a moment, this is not like an altar call response like, hey, I'm, I'm going to choose to read my Bible more. We're not going to have some response like that. But this week, I want you to actually ask the Lord to highlight the things that are keeping the soil of your heart from being fresh and deep and rich. You know, sometimes lack of hunger is an indication of being sick. When you start getting sick, you, you don't feel like eating. But when that sickness is dealt with, then appetite comes back. And so we can go to the Lord, even in the times that seem incredibly dry. I don't think God ever intended us, our relationship with him to be dry. Now, there are times where by living by the Spirit, we're putting aside the gratification of the flesh, but I don't think he, it was ever meant to be a dry contractual relationship. And in those moments, we're like, man, like, God, I've, I feel like I've got a million things coming at me. I've got all these feelings inside. I've got all these stresses, all these anxieties. I know that your word brings life, and yet I have no hunger for it. Go to him and ask, what's quenching my appetite for your word? And God's so faithful. He's not going to beat you over with a stick and say you should do better. But he, he's probably going to highlight something that you might be feeding yourself or sowing into yourself that's keeping you from actually being hungry for his kingdom and his word. And allow him to do that. Allow him to dig into the, the soil of your heart to dig out some things so that you can begin planting new things. And you can say, Jesus, it's only by your grace that I can even pursue you. You've made me into a brand new creation. You've put your spirit inside of me. Every step I take is an act of your grace. And would you stir a fire in my heart that I wouldn't just see your word as a history, history book. I wouldn't just see your word as the next thing that I'm supposed to do. But I would see your word as, as words from a loving father that desires to bring about life through me, through you. And so we're just going to worship. We're going to turn our hearts towards him. And then we're going to close out in prayer. But I encourage you, let him into those spaces that you may have held off from him before, those compartments. Let him into those spaces where there's dry, hard ground. Let him into those spaces where there's shallow, rocky ground. Let him into those spaces that are being choked out by weeds. Go to him. Don't shy away. Don't hide from him because you feel like you're not doing good enough. Go to him and allow him to begin to tend the soil of your heart because he has so many things he desires to produce through you. And he's equipped you with all the resources you need, the spirit of God in you and his word that you can deposit in your heart, but he wants to partner with you. So run to the father and allow him to do the work of tending the soil, to partner with him in, in putting the seed in the ground, to partner with him in tending that seed over time and watching him produce a harvest in your life. So let's worship together.